Good morning. And it is, isn't it? Beautiful this morning. So welcome on this uh, bank holiday weekend. It's uh, lovely to see the sun. Hope it sticks around for a wee while. I haven't seen much of it because I've been in the General Assembly Hall for most part of last week, and I'm afraid it's another dull, grey and dismal place. You don't see much of the sun there, but never mind. I got out for lunch a few times, so I, was, uh, I had lunch with Alan Wilson, who was one of our former assistants here. You may remember Alan about 10 years ago, and he sends his regards to all of you. And I also had lunch with Stuart Love, who left us just about a year and a half ago, another former assistant. Makes it sound as if I had a great time just having lunch, doesn't it? I did. But it wasn't a holiday. I'm not going to dob her in, but somebody said to me, did you enjoy your holiday last week? I said, aye, I only worked 50 hours instead of the usual 75. It wasn't quite a holiday. Anyway, you did have a lovely time last Sunday because I watched the service back and uh, Dorothy Russell, who, is, who I think has been footing with my microphone, actually, I'm trying to get it sorted here. Um, Dorothy Russell, who's the prison chaplain at Shots, was here to conduct the service. If you missed it, then I really encourage you to go and watch it on our YouTube channel if you have internet access. It was wonderful. And she brought with her uh, a chap, a friend of hers called David, and he told a story which was very humbling and also very challenging. So if you didn't see it, go away and watch it if you get a chance to do so. Just a few items um, to bring me up to speed more than anything else, I suppose. And thanks to those who supported the Christian Aid lunch last Sunday, you'll see from the sheet that a total of £528.46 was raised. So that's fabulous. We always like to support um, Christian Aid. And just a wee reminder that next Sunday we celebrate communion. That's both in the morning at 11 o'clock and in the evening at 6.30 p.m. You're welcome to come to one or both of those services. The newsletters, the most recent edition of Kit Matters, are available on the stage for those who deliver them or indeed pick up their own alongside life and work. There's a beautiful picture of the blossom and the trees. And many thanks to Linda Irvin and Colin Weir for putting the work in to produce another excellent edition of our church newsletter. Um, Thanks also to Colin for putting together this pack. Now, you should all all have received one of these this morning as you came in. You'll get a wee chance when you go home to look at it, I hope, and also to use it. The National Weekend of Invitation is something that's happening um, in the third weekend in June, and we are taking part in that. We believe that we're a welcoming church, that we warmly welcome people when they come to share in all that we're doing. But we want to become more of an inviting church and take the opportunity to encourage others to come along and share. So there's information about a quiz and curry night. If you don't like curry, then there's a pasta alternative. That's on the Friday evening. There's an afternoon tea on the Saturday. We're grateful to the Guild for being involved with that. And there's a family film night on the Saturday evening. So a whole lot of information there. Don't just please, please, please. Don't just lay this aside or put it in your recycling bin when you get home. If you don't feel you've got enough courage to actually physically approach somebody and give them an invitation, then at the very least, will you put it through the door of somebody that you live next to? But it would be so much better if you're able to just speak to somebody, either in your street or at your work or wherever you play bowls or golf or whatever it is you do with your leisure time, and invite them to come to one of these events, and maybe even on the Sunday morning as well. Um, Do you know the only thing they can say? They might say no, but they might say yes. And can I tell you that if somebody hadn't invited me, then I probably wouldn't be standing in front of you, both as a believer and as a minister in the church. So take the opportunity to invite people over the next few weeks to join with us in these various events. I think they'll be great. I think there'll be much to celebrate and enjoy. 
Right, and the rest of the news items are on the sheet and have been on the screens as well. Uh, today is Trinity Sunday. I was sorry to miss Pentecost last Sunday. I'm a big fan of celebrating Pentecost. I think the Holy Spirit often gets missed out, particularly in the Church of Scotland. But today is Trinity Sunday. It's the day we remember that we worship one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So leading into our worship this morning, I want to read you just a few verses from the end of Matthew's Gospel. Then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Did you notice, although they worshipped him, some doubted. Well, maybe you've come with some doubts from what's been happening in your life this week, but you can still worship God and still trust that the promise he made to be with us always is a real and a true promise. The God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's worship him in our opening hymn. Number 110 from CH4, glory be to God the Father, glory be to God the Son, glory be to God the Spirit, great Jehovah, three in one. Many thanks to my wee technical assistant who's managed to get a microphone that fits over these huge ears. As we brought our praises to God, let's now say our prayers. Let's join together our hearts as we come to God in prayer. Mighty God, you are beyond all space and time. You are greater than our minds can fully grasp. You are the ruler over all that is and has been 
and ever shall be. You have shown yourself to be our loving Father, kind and merciful, full of goodness and compassion, constantly watching over us and directing our steps. In Jesus Christ, you have come to be our Savior, flesh of our flesh, yet the living image of God, sharing our humanity, yet one with the Father, loving us to the very point of death, and yet the one who brings us life in all its fullness and forevermore. Holy Spirit, you are free and mysterious, the source of guidance and inspiration to God's people. You fill our hearts and our minds and our lives with good things. How we worship and praise you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, God of gods, Lord of lords. We come before you this morning with awe and wonder, with joy and gladness, with love and with praise. We bring our very lives to you and ask that you will touch us at the very core of our being, that we might know that this day we have met with the living God. Lord and God, you call us to go out into the world, to share our faith, and to show your love. You call us to go in the name of Jesus Christ, to make known that name, and to make real to those we meet his presence. You call us to go in the power of your Holy Spirit, to live for you and for others. Forgive us that so often we come to you, but fail to go for you. Forgive us that so easily we turn in on ourselves as individuals and as a congregation, rather than turning outwards towards others. And forgive us that having received so much from your gracious hand, there are times when we give so little. Renew us this day through your Spirit. Restore us this day through the love of Christ. Remake us this day in your likeness that the image of God may be seen and known in and through us. And as you assure us of your forgiveness for the times in which we have failed you in the past, send us out from this place to live and to work tirelessly for your kingdom and to the glory of your name. Amen. Now we're going to sing CH4 number 157. It's a very bright and upbeat song. I was just saying to Eric before we began our service this morning, I really like this song. It's not the easiest tune to catch, I admit that, but it's really good once you do catch it. It's a lovely hymn. Sing of the Lord's goodness, Father of all wisdom. Come to Him and bless His name.
And if you think it's difficult to get your lips and your teeth around, then can you imagine what it's like having to play all of those notes on the keyboard? Well done, Eric. We're going to turn to God's Word, and our reading for this morning is from uh, an Old Testament book, First Chronicles, and there in chapter 29, and we're reading from verse 10 through to verse 20. Uh, we today conclude our uh, six-week series on the Lord's Prayer, and so this is the background to what we're thinking about today. First Chronicles chapter 29 at verse 10. David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly, saying, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. We are foreigners and strangers in your sight, as were all our ancestors, our days on earth are like a shadow without hope. Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a temple for your holy name comes from your hand, and all of it belongs to you. I know, my God, that you test the heart and are pleased with integrity. All these things I have given willingly and with honest intent, and now I have seen with joy how willingly your people who are here have given to you. Lord, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep these desires and thoughts in the hearts of your people forever, and keep their hearts loyal to you. And give my son Solomon the wholehearted devotion to keep your commands, statutes, and decrees to do everything to build the palatial structure for which I have provided. And then David said to the whole assembly, Praise the Lord your God. So they all praised the Lord, the God of their fathers. They bowed down, prostrating themselves before the Lord and the King. Amen. And we give thanks for this reading from God's Word. A shorter song to sing together before we think about what God might be saying to us in this concluding part of our series in the Lord's Prayer. A more modern song as well, written in very recent times, Salvation Belongs to Our God, echoing the themes that are picked up there in First Chronicles 29.
Our prayer today, Lord, is that praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honor and power and strength will be to your name. And not just in the assembly of your people here and now, but as we live our lives out there in the wider community in the week that lies ahead. May our very presence in that community point people to Jesus. For in His name and for His sake we ask this. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be Your name. Your kingdom come, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. End of. Or at least that's what the Gospels say about the Lord's Prayer. But there was something missing if you were listening carefully. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's how we always end the prayer when we say it together, isn't it? And yet, that final phrase that we often will say here in worship is not included in Matthew's gospel and in Luke's gospel. When the disciples come and say to Jesus, teach us to pray, he prays that prayer and finishes with those words, deliver us from the evil one. We don't get that last phrase. It's excluded from the oldest scraps of manuscript that we have of the Gospels. The best texts don't have it in it. The most complete manuscripts exclude it. So, where did it come from and why do we pray it? It's something until I've just mentioned it a moment ago that you probably didn't even realize. My guess is, and I may be wrong about this, some of you maybe even didn't realize that the full text, apart from that phrase, is in both Matthew and Luke's gospel. But maybe if you know your Bibles well, you already at least knew that part. So, where does that last phrase come from? Well, actually, it first appears in AD 90 in a document called the Didache. It was a later addition. It's often referred to, for obvious reasons, by people as the doxology of the Lord's Prayer. And doxology is one of these words which is kind of made up of two words. The word doxa means glory, and logia means word. So, it means to speak a glorious word about God, a doxology. And sometimes we sing doxologies in the church over the years. That's been part of our worship. So, why some 50 to 60 years after Jesus was crucified, why did the wider church decide to add in this phrase, yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, there's three main reasons that people have suggested it might be there. Some folk have said that they thought maybe the prayer was way too short. And it is quite a short prayer, even when you add in that phrase. Some people have said, maybe the phrase, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory was added in because the early Christians didn't like the idea of ending the Lord's prayer with the words, deliver us from the evil one. And if you think about it, that makes sense, doesn't it? Because we don't want to give the devil the last word. And yet, in the way Jesus taught the prayer to His first disciples, that's exactly how He ended it deliver us from the evil one. More than likely, 
This last phrase was added into the prayer that has been prayed by the church for 20 centuries because what it does is it reorientates us. It re-emphasizes that God is the object of our prayers. He is the focus of our prayers. So, when you put that last phrase in, yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever, amen, then it brings the prayer full circle. Because it began, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So, just as the prayer starts with God, it now ends with God. But actually, there's a very good basis for this part of the prayer being there. And it's a scriptural basis. And that's why I read to you from 1 Corinthians chapter 29 this morning. If you were listening carefully, then you would see that that prayer of David is focused on the goodness and the greatness, the almighty power of God. But verse 11 in particular is very familiar if you relate it to that last phrase in the Lord's Prayer. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. That verse 11 from chapter 29 of 1 Chronicles gives us encouragement to know that when we're praying that last phrase in the Lord's Prayer, even although Jesus did not personally utter it Himself to the first disciples, we're still in line with the Word of God. And I hope that you agree with me that that's something that we would like to be in this church, in line with the Word of God. Because the Bible itself says that we should neither add nor take away from Scripture. This prayer in 1 Chronicles 29 is the prayer of David, the king, as he made preparations for his son Solomon to take over from him. And one of David's great endeavors in his kingship, in his reign, was a desire to build a temple in which God's name would be praised. But he knew that he himself would not be the builder of that temple. And so, this prayer in 1 Chronicles 29 makes preparation for Solomon, his son, to follow up and to build what became a glorious temple in which Israel worshipped and sacrificed to God, in which God's name was honored and glorified in which God's kingdom was extended and His power celebrated. So, that's the background to where this last phrase comes from in the prayer that we pray that we call the Lord's Prayer. It comes straight out of the Old Testament. Now, let's think about the phrase for a few moments together. Yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory there's three things there. We pray about God's kingdom. That's about His authority. We pray about God's power. That's about His ability. And we pray about God's glory. That's because God is the one alone who deserves the applause. Yours is the kingdom. When we pray that at the end of the Lord's Prayer, We are exercising our faith. It's a statement of faith. And as you look at the world around you, the facts are against it. In some ways, you look around at the world and you think, how can we pray yours, God, is the kingdom? Because the world's a mess. Kids in the United States of America being mowed down by someone carrying an automatic weapon. People blowing themselves up in front of churches in Pakistan. Children, millions of them, dying 
through starvation or malnutrition. People being displaced from their homes and wandering the earth, having nowhere to lay their head, hardly a tent to put over them. How can we say yours is the kingdom? It's a statement of faith. We believe that the world as it is is not the world as it will be when Jesus comes to reign. Because he has the authority to change it. A story is told of a young child who was taken along by their parent to a prayer meeting in the church. And there was a particular person who attended the prayer meeting who always ended his prayers with a phrase, God is still on the throne. God is still on the throne. You know, with all these rubbish things happening in our world, God is still on the throne. The child, however, misheard. And when he came out of the prayer meeting, kept saying to his mother, God is still on the phone. God is still on the phone. There's a world of difference between God still being on the phone and God still being on the throne. If God is still on the phone only, then we believe that He is somehow distant separated from what's happening in our world. Yes, he's king, but he's an absentee landlord. My friends, God is not on the phone. He's on the throne. And he has all authority in heaven and in earth. The world may not be as it should be, but he is still king. And so we pray yours is the kingdom, and we pray yours is the power. The word that lies behind the English word power is the Greek word dunamis. Does that sound familiar? The word dynamic comes from that Greek word. The word dynamite comes from that Greek word. God's ability, God's power is like dynamite. In fact, it is far greater. We talk about God whom we worship as being omnipotent, and that's just a big fancy word for meaning He is all-powerful. There is nothing God cannot do, but sometimes we don't believe that, or at least we live as if we don't believe that. There was a very good report came to the General Assembly this past week on climate change and about the urgency of needing to do something desperate to change the way in which we live. And fossil fuels like gas and oil were uh, set in the corner of being the baddies, but we use them every day in plastics, as well as to fuel our cars, even if you have an electric car. And we were talking about the importance of using renewables, like solar power and catching the wind, and whatever you think about these wind farms, and I personally think they're very ugly, then they're contributing to what we have available to us on the national grid. But all of that, all of what we have in the world, the Bible tells us, was created by God whom we worship. So, His power is not limited in any way at all. He gives us stewardship of these things, and we ought to manage them well and not just for our generation, but for generations to come, and that was the argument of the report to the General Assembly. But He is the one who is the power 
behind these things. And in a spiritual sense also, although Christ as he stood before Pontius Pilate, about to be sent off to be beaten and crucified, looked as if he was without power, Pilate even said to him, don't you know I have power to kill or set you free? What was Jesus' reply? You would have no power over me unless it was given you by the one who sent me. My Father in heaven, God alone is the one who has the power to decide whether we live or die. So when we say, yours is the kingdom, it's a statement of faith. When we say yours is the power, it's a statement of hope that God has the power, the ability to change situations that look impossible. And then in that phrase, the third thing is yours is the glory. Do you know, we trip these things off our tongue so quickly and we don't think too much about them when we pray them. But yours is the glory. This is a statement of love towards God. By saying yours is the glory, we could otherwise express it at that point in the prayer by standing up and all joining in a round of applause to say, Lord, we want to praise you. We want to thank you. We want to bless you. Sometimes we take the credit, but you deserve the glory. I wonder if you remember the Palm Sunday story. You should. It's not that long since we were thinking about it together coming up to Easter. And when Jesus came into Jerusalem on the back of a young colt, and people were shouting their hosannas and waving palm branches and laying their cloaks down in front of him, some of the Pharisees objected to the fact that they were bringing praise to him. And do you remember what his response was? He says, do you know, if you shut up the people, even the very stones would sing to God. The very stones would sing. Everything in all creation, you and me included, have been created to glorify God. Yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory. We know what glory is. We don't maybe use that word very often in the 21st century. We know what glory is because if our team wins the cup, then we glory in their achievement. If we go to a concert, then we glory in our favorite rock star. To be glorified is to be put in the limelight. Habakkuk, one of the books towards the end of the Old Testament, says this, the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of God as the waters cover the sea. That's what we are praying for when we pray that last phrase in the Lord's Prayer. We're praying that God will be glorified, that He will be honored, that He will receive the praise. And then we use the word forever. And if you look back through history, you'll find that there have been lots and lots of different empires and kingdoms. There was the Persian and the Greek and the Roman and the Ottoman, even the British Empire. But in truth, they've all gone. And what the Bible is saying and what we are saying when we pray the Lord's Prayer is that His kingdom Christ's kingdom will last forever. That's why at the moment that symbol is up on the screen. It looks like a number eight lying on its side, but those of you who know better will know it's a symbol for infinity. God's kingdom, God's power, God's glory will endure forever. So you want to buy into that kingdom, don't you? Of course you do. His kingdom will not fall. And then to end the prayer, what do we say? Amen. 
There it is in both Hebrew and English. It's not just a rip-roaring, hear, hear. We agree with everything that's been said in the prayer. Or is it a way of saying, well, that's us, we'll finish praying now and we'll go on to do something else. Well, actually, it can be both of those. But amen literally means certainly, surely, definitely, inevitably, absolutely. So be it. If you're a Star Trek fan, as I am, then you might have watched Star Trek The Next Generation. And the captain of the starship in that version is one Jean-Luc Picard, a British actor, Patrick Stewart. Same haircut as me. In fact, he might have a wee bit less than I've got. And his famous phrase is, make it so. And then his staff, his crew, make it so. He's the captain giving the command. Well, in a sense, when we say amen at the end of that prayer, we're saying to God, make it so, Lord. Make it so that your kingdom comes, that your power is at work, and that your glory is revealed. Make it so. Professor William Barclay has said this of the Lord's Prayer. It brings the whole of life into the presence of God and brings the whole of God into the whole of life. It's a great prayer. Some people have asked me over the years why I don't use the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. And I don't use it every Sunday because it's such a great prayer. And it deserves to be given thought as we pray it, rather than simply prayed in what can sometimes sound like a trite way that's repetition along the lines of what Jesus actually warned the disciples against when He taught them the prayer. But today, I'd like us to close this reflection by saying the Lord's Prayer together. Remembering many of the things we've learned, I hope, about that prayer along the way, taking our time to say the words rather than just rattling them off, and recognizing particularly that that last phrase, which Jesus did not say as far as we can tell, but which is there in First Chronicles 29, and there's good reason for using it, encourages us to look upwards and forwards to a God of undefeatable purpose, unequaled power, and unending glory. So when we say the Lord's Prayer together, we are humbled by the fact that we are in the very presence of Almighty God sharing in that prayer. That He is interested in all of our needs, our daily bread, our desire for forgiveness, our requirement to be guided not into temptation and to be delivered from the evil one. All of these things are there in this marvelous, marvelous, wonderful, amazing prayer. Shall we bow our heads and say it together reverently? Our Father, which art in heaven, Now let's give our offerings for the work of the kingdom.
And let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, we can never repay all we owe you, or even a fraction of what we have received from your loving hand. But we bring you these gifts, not as a settling of a debt, but as a gesture of gratitude, as an expression of our love offered to you in joyful worship through Christ our Lord. Lord, we pray for all in our world who are searching for peace in their lives. We pray most especially for those who are burdened by anxiety, either about themselves or their loved ones, those who face difficulties and problems to which they can see no solutions. We pray for those wrestling with inner fears, those who are torn apart by emotional or psychological pressures. We pray for those in the midst of change and upheaval in their lives, especially those threatened in a world by violence and in the place of warfare. Father, to all of those in chaos and turmoil, all who are restless and troubled, grant your calm, your tranquility, your quietness, your peace which passes understanding. God of peace, Prince of peace, reach out and still the storm, we pray. In the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. The theme of the General Assembly in the last week was uh, summed up by, by uh, four words, peace be with you. And as we went through the week, we were, uh, it was made pretty clear that apart from the situations of war in our world, even in our own country, even in our own community, perhaps even in your own life, there are a lot of people who don't have the peace of God. But the Prince of Peace is there. And if you have that peace in your heart, the peace of Christ, then you have a responsibility to pass that on to others. We're going to finish our service by singing number 105 from CH4. It's a paraphrase of one of the Psalms, Psalm 148, by our own John Bell. Glory to God above, heavens declare His love. Praise Him, you angels. Praise Him, all you high and heavenly host. And praise God forevermore. Bless you and 
keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you peace.